Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome today. Uh, it is my great pleasure to introduce Severin Otizer, who is the author of our just published book, The Front Lines of Peace, An Insider's Guide to Changing the World. Uh, in this book, she draws on her more than 20 years of experience working in and researching the international aid and peace building world in 12 different conflict zones. Um, she has spent her academic career explaining why it is that international aid is practiced by the organizations that she calls Peace Inc. doesn't work. But in this book, uh, she turns her attention to stories of ordinary people on the ground, uh, the very people who live with and are most affected by conflict and local violence, uh, and who have found ways to build lasting and meaningful peace in their communities in ways that big aid organizations could not. Um, and they've done so without big budgets or international fanfare. Um, it's a fascinating and engrossing book that is, and I hope I don't sound like a cliche for saying this, but it is truly funny, uh, heartbreaking, and inspiring in equal terms. Um, Severine is professor of political science at Barnard College. I think she has won pretty much every academic award one can possibly win in her field, and I'm sure she's destined to win many more. Um, and she's someone I've wanted to work with for quite some time. Um, and who I was just really honored to work with on this book. Uh, and I'm also pleased to say that the book is already getting rave reviews, including in the New York Times and Foreign Affairs. And with that, I'm very happy to now turn things over to Severine and let her tell you about her terrific book. And then just to let you know at the end, um, after Severine's finished speaking, we'll have some time for Q&A. So thanks, welcome Severine. Thank you so much, Angela. Thank you for organizing this event. Thanks to Kyla and Kathleen for helping organize the event as well. Uh, and thanks to all of you for joining us. It's absolutely wonderful to be doing a talk for Oxford University Press because I've, I love so many of the books that you've published and I've admired the authors and the editors and the teams for so long that it feels amazing to be finally kind of part of the family now. So thank you. And I understand that uh, there are people joining us from virtually all over the world today, uh, which is absolutely fantastic. As for me, I'm talking with you from my apartment, from my uh, living room here in New York City, because uh, due to the COVID-19 pandemic, I still cannot work from my office on campus. But it doesn't matter because I'm absolutely thrilled to talk with you about my new book, The Frontlines of Peace. So The Frontlines of Peace is a book about hope. It's a book about the ordinary and yet extraordinary individuals and communities who have found effective ways to confront violence. And so to start, I want to show you a, uh, I want to tell you a story about these kinds of people. It's a story that takes place in Congo, in the midst of one of the deadliest conflicts since World War II. In 2007, a little boy named Luca was kidnapped and forced to work for an armed group and for rebels just like the one you see in my photo. And Luca was so small at the time that he couldn't even hold a rifle. So his commanders would march him up front and use him as a human shield. Somehow, Lucas survived, and after three years with the armed group, he was released, his commanders released him, and he was sent back home to his mother, Justin. But Luca had trouble assimilating. He hated school. He was often hungry because his mom didn't have much money. And he still believed what his commanders had drilled into him, that the only way to survive was to use violence. So Luca kept running away to join militias. The only time he felt safe was when he had a gun in his hands. He was eight and this was the only light that he knew. Meanwhile, in the United States, a young Indian American woman named Vijaya Thakur was working for various aid organizations focused on Congo. And Vijaya was growing very uncomfortable with her colleagues' work. Her colleagues used the traditional top-down approach to peace building. They relied on 
outsider skills and expertise. And as a result, they ended up harming the very people they wanted to help. So for instance, most of them believed that violence in Congo was due to the illegal exploitation of minerals like coltan, which the young men in my photo are mining. So Vijaya's colleagues spent their time and efforts trying to get new regulations on conflict minerals, but the new laws cost, their, cost many vulnerable people their job. And these people had to join armed groups as a way to survive. So whenever Vijaya traveled to Congo, she started asking ordinary citizens what they believed would lead to peace. And that's a photo of her doing just that. And eventually, she decided to try something in the village where Justine and Luca were living. In partnership with local activists, Vijaya organized lengthy meetings and workshops so that the residents would develop their own analysis of the conflicts they face and decide what the best responses would be. And the first part of the plan that the villagers came up with was for Vichaya and her fellow activists to give out $40 each to a few village women, uh, including Justine, who used the money to start small businesses like tailoring or donut shop, businesses of the kind you see in my photos. The businesses took off and eventually, Vijaya, the participants had enough money to reimburse uh, the money and they used the money to implement the second part of their plans. So they installed taps for clean drinking water and they organized training for the teachers to learn how to curb ethnic violence rather than fueling it. Eventually, they lobbied local authorities for protection and virtual services. So Luca now had three meals a day, shoes without holes, and role models who didn't use violence to survive and gain power. And like Luca, all of the, um, all of the villagers were safer and healthier. And one day, Vitaya was talking with Justine, and Justine kept using the word success to refer to the whole initiative. It was because Luca had turned 13 and for the first time in his life, he was speaking in the future tense. He had stopped trying to run away all the time and he was making plans, peaceful plans within his community. He now wanted to hold a pencil instead of a gun. And now you see where Rachel, the cover artist, found her inspiration for the cover of The Front Lines of Peace. Vichaya, decided to create the Resolve Network, which has used this approach to help more than 7,000 people over the past 10 years. All individuals at risk of being recruited by armed groups and more than half of them former combatants like Luca. So militias have formed and reformed in Congo. The pressure to remobilize has been enormous, but not a single person participating in the Resolve programs has started or gone back to fighting. And to me, this story is inspiring. It's also very telling because there are big differences between the way most peace building organizations work and what Vichaya did. So to start, Vichaya decided to build peace from the grassroots by relying on insiders instead of always focusing on elite leaders and capital cities. And even more importantly, Vitraya didn't come and impose her beliefs, and that way she avoided doing more harm than good. Unlike so many people before her, Vitraya was humble, she was respectful, and she put ordinary citizens in the driver's seat. Peace builders who work like Vijaya are a small minority in the aid world, but they exist. I found them in many different countries, working for many different organizations. And the work they do is incredibly important because unfortunately, there are many people who face the same kind of terrible circumstances that Justin and Luca were facing. 
More than one and a half billion people live under the threat of violence in more than 50 conflict zones around the world, in the places you see in my photo. So peace building is a crucial task for many states and international institutions. And when I say peace building, I really mean any and all actions that help promote peace before, during, and after a conflict. But the thing is that our templates and techniques for approaching war and peace just don't work. Afghanistan, Colombia, Congo, Syria, Ukraine, Myanmar, we've heard the same story many times before. There was violence. The United Nations got involved. Donor countries pledged millions in assistance. Warring parties called for ceasefire. They signed agreements, held elections, and the headlines praised peace. And then uh, a week or two later, sometimes just days later, violence flared up again. Sometimes it had never actually ended, and in many cases, it continued for years after. And our newspapers keep running headlines like the ones you see on my slide. More than half of all ongoing wars have already lasted for more than 20 years. In just the past five years, wars have spawned the worst refugee crisis since World War II. And inhabitants of war-torn countries and onlookers from the outside are fed up with the apparent inability of governments, peacekeepers, and international institutions to end violence. And there has been plenty of discussion about what has gone wrong when we've tried to stop wars in the past. But now, I think it's time to ask what has gone right. And it turns out that elections don't build peace, and democracy itself might not be the golden ticket, at least, not in the short term. Contrary to what most politicians preach, fielding peace doesn't require billions in aid or massive international interventions. Instead, it often involves giving the power to ordinary citizens. Ultimately, many successful examples of peace building in the past few years have involved innovative grassroots initiatives led by local people and often supported by foreigners, just like the South African officer you see in my photo, and often needing methods shunned by the international elite. So rather than focusing on abstract peace agreements, handshakes between presidents and negotiations between government and rebel leaders, the front lines of peace details the concrete, everyday actions that actually make a difference on the ground. So some of these are bizarre, some are creative, some involve age-old traditions, and some are just common sense. My book explains how peace building can work better so that we can finally improve the lives of billions of people. And I showed that to end violence from war and also to address violent conflicts at home, whether home is New York, Paris, or Johannesburg, we have to fundamentally change the way we view and drill peace. And this argument draws on more than 20 years of research in 12 different conflict zones, uh, the ones you see in red uh, are on my slide, um, and these are places where I work both as an activist and a researcher. And I also drew on more than 800 in-depth interviews. And so here in the photo on the right-hand side, you see me conducting interviews, and here in the photo on, on the bottom left, uh, you see me conducting participant observations. I was patrolling with United Nations peacekeepers. And I was very happy that day. I thought, yay, I'm fitting in. I'm such a good ethnographer. Uh, but the thing is that I'm not a man, and there were only men in this military base. And also, I felt that there was something wrong with my bulletproof jacket. I went patrolling for several hours, and the bulletproof, the bulletproof jacket was heavy, it was uncomfortable, it didn't protect my heart or any of my vital organs. 
And it's only when we were back to the base that one of the Indian officers told me, huh, you know you've been wearing it backward? Anyway, I still got very good material that day. In the front lines of peace, I first tell the stories of ordinary people and grassroots activists who have managed to make a difference in war zones. Then uh, I describe the limitations of the traditional way to build peace, which I call Peace Inc., and which relies on governments, elites, and foreign peace builders, and usually exclude ordinary people and uh, local activists. Drawing on these stories, uh, I then suggest a better way to help reestablish peace during and after armed conflict. And the conclusion shows how inhabitants of ostensibly peaceful countries, for instance, in Europe and North America, can use the lessons from the book to decrease tensions at home, ranging from inner city conflicts to political and religious divides. So let me tell you the story of Ichwi, which is quite literally an island of peace in Congo. For the past 25 years, the deadliest conflict or one of the deadliest conflicts since World War II has raged around Ichwi. And despite the presence of one of the largest, actually the largest and one of the most expensive peacekeeping mission in the world, Several million people have died and hundreds continue to die every day. But Itri itself has avoided mass violence. And so the island is stunningly beautiful, as you can see in the photo I took when I was there. But what makes the place even more noteworthy and the piece even more surprising is that the island contains all of the same preconditions for violence that have fueled generalized fighting in other parts of Congo. You have a geostrategic location. It was located right at the border between Congo and Rwanda, two countries that have been at war regularly since the 1990s. Italy also has mineral resources, ethnic tensions, lack of state authority, extreme poverty, local conflict over land and traditional power, and many other features that have led to generalized fighting in the neighboring provinces. And what's fascinating about Ijwi is that the island is peaceful because of the active, everyday involvement of all of its citizens, including the ones you see in my photos, and including the poorest and least powerful ones. So it's not the state or the police or the army who manage to control tensions, and it's not foreign peace builders. It is the members of the community themselves. They do that by fostering what they call a culture of peace, by organizing in grassroots associations and local structures that help resolve conflicts, and by drawing on strong beliefs that help deter violence between both inside, by both insiders and outsiders, uh, such as blood packs. Blood packs are traditional promises between two parties who agree never to hurt each other. The story of Idri shows us that local community resources can build peace better than the usual elite agreements and outside interventions. And foreign peace builders can help in this process. So take the teams of the Life and Peace Institute in Congo. LPI is a Swedish peace building organization that is focused on working at the grassroots and that is involved in various conflict zones. The LPI Congo team bases its action on in-depth local expertise and rejects universal approaches to peace building. They rely on local employees uh, supervised by a few foreigners, and these foreigners often have extensive pre existing country knowledge. LPI doesn't implement programs directly. Instead, uh, it works with and through a few hand picked local organizations 
And the main role of these organizations is to support people on the ground. These local organizations empower ordinary citizens to develop their own analysis of their community's conflict and then decide on the most feasible answers, just like they're doing in the photo on my slide, and then to implement those solutions. So you see the difference with the usual way to build peace in conflict zones. In the LPI model, it's not foreigners based in capital cities and headquarters who conceive, design, and implement peace building programs. It's not national or provincial elites either, and it's not the state or the government. Instead, uh, it is the intended community members themselves, including ordinary people who conceive, design, and implement peace building programs with the help of LPI and its local partners. And I'll tell you, I'll give you a concrete example so that you can see how this actually works on the ground. So for years, there was a deadly conflict in the Ruzizi Plain in Eastern Congo. It led to a lot of deaths, a lot of suffering, and the involvement of local militias, uh, Congolese uh, leaders, and the Rwandan government. And in 2007, three Congolese organizations decided to address these tensions with the help of LPI and its local partners. And so for three years, they focused on understanding what the problem was. They organized a lot of large and small scale meetings, just like the one you see in my photo. And in these meetings, they included everyone, politicians, uh, ordinary people, army commanders, soldiers, rebel leaders, civil society activists, farmers, ministers, women's groups, etc. They progressively realized that the conflict was not so much a proxy war between Congo and Rwanda, as we interveners thought at the time, but rather it was a conflict between herders and farmers because cattle often destroyed crops. The herders retaliated by killing, no, the farmers retaliated by killing the herders whose families reached out to local militias who went on to attack the farmers' communities and so on and so forth. And so all of the people involved, the ordinary people, the combatants, they all designed solutions that they thought would work to address the problems that they viewed at the root of the violence. So for instance, they established routes for moving cattle with minimal disruptions to farmer. They erected public signposts to really clearly mark the road and the route that the herders should take with their cattle. They also established mediation committees. And by the way, this is one of the signposts. They also established mediation committees in which representatives of both herders and farmers would smooth out any tensions that may arise because, you know, with cattle, even if you have this kind of very, very clear path, you can't always make sure that they stay on the right path. And so, of course, there were issues, challenges, and setbacks. Um, but to make a long story short, while all of the elite agreements and outside interventions had never really made a difference before, local residents saw tangible results once LPI and its local partners got involved. The seasonal migration of cattle took place for several years with very little violence. Dozens of militiamen handed in their weapons and communities that were fighting slowly started working and living together. They started sharing the same market, for instance. So outsiders can help reestablish peace, but to really help, they can't continue acting the way they usually do because there are countless limitations with the conventional way to build peace which i call peace incorporated peace inc 
and which relies on governments, elites, and foreign peace builders, and usually exclude local activists and ordinary citizens. The Peace Inc. traditional approach to peace building relies on misleading and detrimental assumptions, such as the idea that only top-down intervention can end armed violence, that all good things come together. So for instance, that democracy naturally leads to peace. And the idea that only outsiders have the required skills and expertise to build peace. Take the way my own career in international aid got started. When I was 22, my very first job, or 23, Anyway, my very first job out of graduate school was as assistant country director for Médecins du Monde, Doctors of the World in Kosovo. And that's me at the time. And uh, in the photo is also my wonderful husband, Philippe, who, by the way, owns the copyright of many of the photo you see in the book and in my presentation today. So when I arrived in Kosovo, I didn't speak Albanian or Serbo-Croatian. I had virtually no knowledge of Kosovo history, politics, and culture. I actually started reading my first book about the Balkans on the flight there, but the, the flight was too short, so I never finished that book. But I got the job because I spoke decent English, uh, and I had two fancy master's degrees, a good training in political analysis, and some field experience in several post-war countries and developing places. And in hindsight, I feel terrible when I think about my Kosovo assistant at the time. His name was Nerim. My job was to analyze the political, security, and humanitarian situation in Kosovo and write reports for my supervisors. But it was Nerim who had the expertise that I lacked. Nerem had 20 years experience analyzing political and social issues in the Balkans. He had a tremendous knowledge of Kosovo history, politics, and culture. He had lived in Kosovo all his life. He was also much older and much wiser than I was. But I was the outsider, so I was in charge. And the thing is, I had never supervised anyone in my life before. I was 23. So I had no idea how to deal with him. And eventually, I found a way to keep him busy. I asked him to compile and translate clippings from the local press. I can still see him every morning religiously posting his work on our bulletin board. And none of my colleagues read it. Even I often didn't have the time to do that. That was such a waste of time, energy, and talent. And I realized afterward that this was not a stroke of good luck for me and bad luck for Nerim. That was a typical situation for foreign peace builders. Most foreign peace builders assume that local people do not have what it takes to build peace, that they are incompetent, corrupt, and violent, otherwise they wouldn't be at war. And by contrast, foreigners believe that they have the required skills and expertise to build peace. To them, what makes a good intervener is education and work experience in specialized topics like uh, gender or human rights or election organizations, and if possible, having work in a variety of conflict zones. And in contrast, and although there are exceptions, the knowledge of country specialists is much less valued and the knowledge of local people is usually trivialized. So the result is that in virtually all aid and peace building organizations, foreigners fill the management positions and local people make up the lower level staff. And the foreigners often don't speak the local languages, and they often have no in-depth understanding of the local societies, cultures, and histories, just like me 
in Kosovo. And there is a story that to me really encapsulates all of that. In 2004, rebels took over the city of Bukavu in Eastern Congo, the, the town you see in my photo. And the rebels went on a looting, raping and killing spree. And at a point, a little boy and his mother saw several soldiers enter the house just next to theirs. They heard shouts and screams. It was obvious that their neighbor was about to be raped. So the little boy ran to seek help at the nearby peacekeeping base. But when he arrived, uh, the sentry on duty that day was a Uruguayan soldier. And the soldier didn't, didn't speak French and didn't speak Swahili. So the little boy was panicking. He tried and tried to communicate what was happening, but still the peacekeeper couldn't understand. And then at a point, the peacekeeper broke into a large smile and he made a sign that, yes, I got it, wait. He went inside the base and he came back a few minutes later with a pack of cookies that he handed to the boy. So yes, interveners do not always understand what's going on and relying exclusively on them can be really problematic. Another big issue with our standard approach to peace building is that many conflicts revolve around political, social, and economic states that are distinctively local. And when I say local, I really mean at the level of the individual, the family, the clan, or the community. So our standard top-down approach to peace building that, rel that relies on governments and, and capital-based elites is not and cannot be enough. And I realized that during one of my very first trips to Congo. In 2003, I met this woman who was my age. Her name was Isabel. Local militias had attacked Isabel's village. They had killed many men, raped many women. They had looted everything. And then they wanted to take Isabel, but her husband stepped in and he said, no, please, please don't take Isabel. Please take me instead. So he had gone to the forest with the militias and Isabel never saw him again. And the reason why the rebels had attacked Isabel's village was not because of anything related to national and international tensions like the war between Congo and Rwanda, no. It was because the rebels wanted to take the land that the villagers needed to cultivate food and to survive. And Isabel's story has stayed in my mind all these years because it embodies the awful consequences of local conflicts that international peace builders so often ignore. And I'm happy to elaborate on all of the problems with our standard approach to peace during the discussion if you're interested, but I think for the 10, 15 minutes that I have left, I want to focus on how we can change that. And I think that we really need to learn from success stories instead of always focusing on challenges, setbacks and issues. So these past few years, I've looked for cases of what I call surprising peace. Places where everything conspires to cause violence and yet somehow you have peace. And I've found places like that all over the world in Congo, Colombia, Afghanistan, Israel and the Palestinian territories, Somaliland, like in the two villages where I took the photos you see now. And the example I like best is the story of Somaliland. So there is a really interesting contrast between, on the one hand, Somalia, which is extremely violent, has some of the highest ranking in the world's least desirable category, most corrupt country, second most failed state, etc. And on the other hand, you have the autonomous region in the north of Somalia that is named Somaliland, 
that went through a devastating independence war with Somalia in the late 80s and the 1990s. A war that destroyed nearly 90% of the towns, uh, some of which still haven't been fully rebuilt, as you can see in the photo I took when I was there. But for the past 20 years, Somaliland has experienced little violence, little terrorism, and it now has a well-functioning state, decent public services, as you can see in my photo of the capital Hargeza, and even some kind of functioning democracy. So of course, there are many differences for uh, many, many reasons for the difference between Somalia and Somaliland. But the key one is that the usual peace inc outsiders led top-down approach to peace building prevailed in the rest of somalia while somaliland benefited from sustained grassroots peace building initiatives that were led by insiders by somalilanders themselves just like the people you see in my photos and the story of somaliland shows us that local people can help build peace, not only on a small scale, like in each week, but also over a large territory and a quasi-state. And the good news is that outsiders can help in this process. Because in my research, I found a lot of original out-of-the-box approaches by interveners who did manage to put local people in the driver's seat and to actually make a difference on the ground. And I talk about these people a lot in the book. They are named Vijaya Thakur, Banu Altumbas, Peter Van Holden, uh, James Canberry, Lee McBowie, I, I could go on and on. They come from all over the world and they work for very different organizations in very different countries, but they have a few things in common. They don't think that as outsiders, they know better, that they have the right theories, skills, or expertise, or that they bring the ideal solutions to people's problems. Instead, uh, they respect local residents, they listen to them, and they're open-minded. They understand that other people may have a different understanding of peace, democracy, and development, and different priorities. They also know the local context well. They speak at least some of the local languages and they have extensive local networks. They're in it for the long run. They stay on site for years, sometimes decades. They don't place themselves at the forefront of peace efforts and they don't put their logos everywhere. Instead, uh, they remain low profile and they turn the spotlight on the achievements of their local partners, local organizations, local staff, ordinary people. They're flexible. They keep adapting their strategies based on the results and feedback they get and the way the situation evolves. And lastly, they understand that sometimes there are hard choices to be made because not all good things come together. So sometimes we may have to make hard choices, for instance, choosing between good things like peace and democracy or peace and justice. And the best interveners understand that they shouldn't be the ones to make these choices. The people who have to live with the consequences of a decision should be the ones making it. And by way of conclusion, there is one last thing that I want to mention. All of these stories, all of these lessons from conflict zones can help us address not only tensions in war zones around the world, but also violent conflicts at home, uh, whether we live in uh, North America or in Europe or in other ostensibly peaceful parts of the world. So for instance, we all know that violence is rising in the United States. Um, thankfully, it's nowhere near the level of violence that we see in, Colum in Congo or Somalia or Colombia. Uh, but still, there are three things that all of us can learn 
from the residents of conflict zones so that we can help decrease tensions and decrease violence around us. To start, uh, we can develop informal relationships with our opponents, whether they are political, religious, or cultural opponents. It is by talking, listening, and bonding over shared interests that the residents have managed to decrease violence in the peaceful places that I've told you about, just like my two friends, the two, two people you see in my photo have done in Idzwe. In the United States, it is also the strategy used by people like Christian Picciolini, who's a former gang leader, whom you see in my photo, and Daryl Davis, the African-American jazz musician you see in this photo. By developing personal relationships with members of white extremist groups, Christian and Daryl have managed to convince hundreds of white extremist militants to renounce hatred. So for us, sport club, um, art associations, religious groups, trade unions, these are all good places where we can start building common grounds. We can also build on the elements of our own cultures to help decrease tensions and, and smooth out issues around us. You remember how the inhabitants of Ijwe and Somaliland draw on their own specific customs and beliefs to decrease tensions around them? Well, in the United States, in the south side of Chicago, there was a group of women who were fed up with seeing so much bloodshed and violence around them. So they decided to hang out on street corners. They brought folding chairs and they sat on them for hours and hours. And the thing is that in Chicago, nobody wants to kill someone in front of their own mothers. So the number of shootings and killings in their communities has decreased a lot. And the last thing we can all do is to support bottom-up grassroots associations with time, money, efforts, whatever we can spare. Again, you remember how important local associations were in helping build a heaven of peace in each week. Well, grassroots associations have proven just as effective in other parts of the world. For instance, in the United States, the organization Cure Violence has managed to reduce shooting and killings by up to 73% in more than 20 cities by using the very kind of insider-led bottom-up approach that we've seen at work in HWE and Somaliland. And of course, our new administration and Congress have a very important role to play because Lasting peace lasts only when built both from the top down and from the bottom up. But the important point is that whether at home or abroad, we solely need more individuals like Vijaya and Justin and more organizations that work like Resolve and the Light and Peace Institute. We solely need more programs like those that I've told you about because it's with people and organizations and programs like these that we can help the one and a half billion people who live under the threats of violence in conflict zones around the world and that we can also help decrease tensions and violence in our own communities. All of these ideas are not magic ones, but because they take into account deeply rooted causes of conflict, they can definitely be game changers. Thank you so much. Thanks, Severin. Um, We'll have a short time for some questions uh, now. Uh, but one thing that I actually I wanted to ask you um, that I heard you it's 
address in a different um, interview that you did around the book and that I thought was, it's a bit of a basic question, but it's so, your answer was so fascinating and I thought so revealing of why it is that the, the work that you have done in this book and for this book is so uh, essential. And that's, um, how do you, um, how do you define peace and how do the people who you have um, worked with um, that you, you know, whose stories you recount in this book, how do they define peace? So that's something that's so interesting. When, when I started working on peace, I defined peace like everybody does. And, you know, there is a huge, uh, there is a huge um, disagreement among academics. Do you define peace by the number of people killed or by other criteria? Do you define peace by, uh, if, you, if you use the number of people killed, is it only civilians? Is it civilians and soldiers? Uh, is it 10 people per year, 100? thousand, et cetera, et cetera. And so that's the definition I used to have. And then I started thinking, oh, but people who say that we should think about the conditions to make peace sustainable, uh, that's also interesting. So for example, do we need democracy? Do we need human rights? And then I started asking people in conflict zones and I got answers that were completely different. So at the very beginning of my research, 15 years ago, I asked and uh, I asked a child and he said, well, it's eating to my heart's content. I was like, okay, he's young. He didn't understand my question. And so I, and, and that was in Congo. And then I asked this question again to his dad and his dad said, well, it's sending my children to school. Okay, there must be a problem with my question. And then I went to Timor-Leste. I asked that question again. And again, I got the it's children it's sending my children to school i started thinking okay there is something i don't get and and then the more i asked this question the more i got different uh different uh, different answers so a woman for instance instance said well it's sleeping in my pajamas like, okay what do you mean well she she was in colombia and she said before, uh, when, during the high, the peak of the violence, I had to sleep fully dressed with the light on because I, th I knew that there might be fighting during the night and I would have to run away as soon as possible and hide in the jungle. But now I think that there is peace in my community because I feel safe enough to sleep in my pajamas. Uh, and others were telling me, well, it's because I feel that there is peace because I can actually uh, sleep at night without the dogs barking. Because when the dogs are barking, it's usually because there are soldiers entering the village. So many, many different definitions of peace, which I think is really interesting and really important to take into account when we're trying to think about how to build peace on the ground because that's definitely not the kind of thing that the high-level peace agreements and the high-level negotiations are usually taken into account. Absolutely. Um, and if you'd like to ask uh, questions of Severin, please um, feel free to enter your question in the um, Q&A uh, screen. Um, another question, um, as we all know, the internet is a perfect vehicle to spread disinformation and mistrust on a massive scale. Trust, on the other hand, is much more difficult to create and build on. In your work, have you found effective ways in which you have been able to scale trust and promote peace, other than in one-to-one -one conversations or small groups? Yes, I think that the, the work uh, that uh, the organizations I was mentioning, uh, Resolve, uh, the Life and Peace Institute, and, and the other organizations I mentioned in the book, uh, they found a way to, to scale up uh, the trust uh, by, um, uh, they, they rely, yes, they, they work in small groups meetings, uh, but they always tell people once they have reached once the people in the group have reached an agreement they always tell them to please educate the communities uh fight misinformation within your community tell people around you what you what you have learned and also report back to us so, so that we can adapt our strategies um so basically starting with small groups but having these groups be ambassadors and and being relays for for peace that has worked very well in in Congo uh, in Somalia and and the example of Somaliland to me is also a really interesting way of how people have managed to to rebuild trust uh, so 
now, before I was telling you about rebuilding trust within a community, uh, mm -hmm. and Somaliland, it's more rebuilding trust in the political institutions and in the state and in, in, in the broader society. Uh, and again, to me, that has been really by starting at the grassroots. So starting with small groups, small discussions, relying on the people that, uh, that the individuals trust. So for example, the imams are really important. It, uh, Somaliland and Somalia is a really, really religious uh, Muslim country. And the imams have a lot of respect, a lot of power. Uh, the clan chiefs as well have a lot of respect and a lot of power so it's building on these people re-establishing peace uh, sorry re-establishing trust in uh, in certain leaders and then having these leaders come together to select the next uh, the next level of the leads, the ones that are, that are going to uh, build the state and that are going to uh, rule the society and that has worked very well in Somaliland because uh, I mean, there are lots of issues in Somaliland, uh, but uh, I felt that there was some kind of trust in the elite, in the institutions, uh, and in the people who represented uh, Somalilanders. Um, another question: um, You mentioned uh, you mentioned a few children in your stories. Um, how did they factor into a peace building strategy? So thanks for asking, because it really depends if you're talking about Peace Inc, the standard peace building strategy, or whether you're talking about the alternative approach that I think works so well. Uh, in the Peace Inc approach, the, chi the children don't factor at all. Uh, or they factor as, oh, we need to send them to school. Like, you know, they're recipient there. <laughs> like, they're completely irrelevant. Um, if you look at the alternative approach, the children are part of the community. Uh, and so they are uh, in each week, for instance, the, 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 you remember this Congolese island that I like so much, uh, uh, this heaven of peace? Well, the, ch the children are educated from their youngest age to learn what it means to live in a culture of peace. And from the youngest age, they learn not only from their parents, they learn how you know, how to be peaceful members of the society and what it means to maintain peace on a daily basis. But they also learn to take actions on their own to build peace and to maintain peace. So that there was my uh, my research assistant, Kair, uh, when he was, I think, 18, 17 or 18 or 20. Um, he was uh, still very young. Mm -hmm. He realized that some of the kids and teenagers were getting a bit out of hand in his community. They started fighting among themselves. Uh, they were talking about raping girls. So, you know, things were not going well. So, Kair and his friends, uh, uh, he took a couple of friends from high school and they decided to organize a soccer club. They thought, well, there is a problem in my community. I'm going to ask, uh, I'm going to provide the kids with something else, with a better thing to do in their spare, spare time than using violence. And he organized a soccer club. He provided the kids with nonviolent role models. And that works. Uh, the kids started again, you know, going back into being peaceful members of the society. And when you look uh, at the organizations like Resolve and the Life and Peace Institute, when I was saying they include everybody in the discussion, in the definition of the problems, and in the definition of the solutions, it's also asking when there are child soldiers, making sure that the child soldiers get to speak up, that they get to be involved, and that they get to say, this is why I got involved in fighting. This is why I kept running away to join militias. This is why I don't feel safe in my community. And this is why I think uh, this strategy would work and that strategy that you have in mind is never gonna work. So again, really depends on which strategy we're talking about. Okay. Um, another question, um, what inspired you to want to get involved and get, get involved in and work in the peace industry? Oh, um, well, it's because I, I can't stand violence. Uh, and to me, peace, peace building is getting rid of violence. And I can't stand violence because I, I experienced that as a child. I know intimately what it does to an individual. I, I can't stand violence. And I can't stand the idea that uh, other people are facing violence. Like, it's just, yeah, I hate it. And so I, I wanted to 
do something against violence. And I thought that I would do that by being a journalist. And I tried and it was an absolute disaster. Uh, and then I thought, okay, I'm going to be a humanitarian aid worker. Uh, so I worked for Doctors Without Borders, Doctors of the World, et cetera, for, for a couple of years. But uh, I quickly realized that there were huge problems uh, with the aid industry and problems that I detail in part in, uh, in the front lines of this. And also I got really, really frustrated at addressing the causes of violence rather than the consequences. And humanitarian aid, when you bring food or blankets or medical supplies to, to communities and to people, you're addressing the consequences of violence, but you're not preventing rape, pre preventing them from being raped, from being displaced, from being tortured, etc. And, and I wanted to, to work on the causes of violence. So that's how I got fascinated with peace building. And that's why I've worked on that for the past 20, 25 years, 20 years. So I think we have time for one last question, and it is, um, what are some good ways for those of us isolated by the pandemic and stuck in bubbles or echo chambers of like-minded communities to help build peace and reduce political hostilities within the U.S. during this increasingly polarized time? So I, I think that we can really use the three strategies that I was mentioning at, at the end of my presentation. So I was, I was talking about building common ground with our opponents. Uh, we can do that online, just like we can do that in, in person. So reaching out to people who disagree with us too, like we all have I think we all have this one person on, on Facebook or on Twitter or, uh, you know, on other social media who has views completely opposed to ours. Well, rather than getting into a fight with that person, trying to build common ground, trying to understand and, and trying if that person is extremist and promoting violence, trying to, to bring them back to, to a, a less violent way of working. Um, and uh, the, the second thing I was mentioning is building, yes, building on the elements of our own culture. So that really depends on, on whether, like, you know, if, if you're a religious person, uh, I know that every religion has uh, texts and, and teachings that tell you love the, the other just, just like you love yourself. So we can build on that. We can, we can draw on uh, history for Africa. I know that uh, African-American communities in, in the United States are drawn the teachings of Martin Luther King, who, who was teaching nonviolence. So th there are many different ways, depending on, on our own cultures that, that we can use. And, and again, it can be done from our own home uh, because we still have access to, to a lot of communications means. And, and the last thing is that we can support the grassroots associations. And, and that can be as, you know, if, if we have money to spare that can be as easy as writing a check to cure violence or, or to live free or to one of the grassroots associations that, that does really good work. Or if we have time and if we've been vaccinated and we can go out, then we can go and volunteer with them. Uh, or, you know, whatever we can spur. Or, or if we're good in communication, we can help them with their PR strategy, you know, whatever <laughs> works and whatever, but asking them first what they need. Uh, and usually money, time, and efforts is usually what they'll tell you that they need. Great. Well, thank you so much, Severin. And um, thanks to everybody who joined the conversation. Um, there is a link um, to buy the book. If you're interested in buying the book, um, we hope you'll read it and uh, enjoy it as much as um, I did. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Angela. And thank you, everyone, for joining us.